Welcome to another edition of Flea Market Fantasy, the world's second greatest Bronze Age era comic book podcast. Joining me as always is new Mike L, Kevin Jank. Who's ready to get fisted? Not me, I can tell you that much. <laughs> but uh, today we are reading Iron Fist issue 8 from 1976. Ugh. And joining yeah. us to discuss this issue is a very special guest. He's an author and raconteur. It's our old buddy, Miles Watson. Miles! I'm ready to get fisted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Miles Watson, usually we like to have the guests pick the book when they come on, but it's it's tough to do that because it takes a lot of work, you know, like scheduling-wise, the way we record this and everything. So uh, sometimes we just reach out and say, hey, you want to come on? We're doing this book. And you got roped into doing it. Because this book kind of has a slight tie-in to something you're doing at the moment. It's top secret project. We won't discuss too much about it. But People uh, don't know that Miles was actually uh, orphaned in a plane crash in the Himalayas. And no, 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 no. That's not, that's not true at all. <laughs> Is it? No, I don't think so. Yeah. But, uh, Miles, this issue of Iron Fist involves Chinese street gangs. That's right. Golden tigers. tigers or something like that, yeah. But you, you're working on a project that is heavily involved in such a subject matter, right? I am. I am working on, uh, I'll keep it somewhat vague, but. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as, as you, Ed, Mike Delp, my editor. Yeah. No. Right. You, I see I'm using comic book like exposition here, yeah. which I, we will be discussing in, in, for this <laughs> issue, but, uh, specifically, but, uh, the, as, as my editor, you know that I am doing a book on a gangster who was a high-ranking member of a Chinese street gang in the service of a Tong in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a fantastic life story. And uh, a lot of the shit is, it it would be unbelievable if I didn't factually know it was true, uh, how wild it is being being a young gangster in the 80s, in the era of 80s New York. Uh, yeah. The terrible, terrible Steinbrenner, um, Steinbrenner <laughs> era, the the dark days of Steinbrenner's reign over the Mets, John Gotti, uh, Eddie the Yankees, Gosh, you know, that. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the, the reason you're here is because I want you to uh, authenticate all the gritty details of the Chinese street gang in this Iron Fist issue. You know, I shall. You'll be able to brutal. tell us how true to life it is. Yeah, not to tell tales out of school, but Miles, isn't it true that this book is just a front for you trying to create your own Chinese mafia and uh, infiltrate the Chinese underworld? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't say that out loud. What are you doing? You'll be dead by the end of this podcast. <laughs> but, but Miles, do you have any other knowledge of Iron Fist before you read this issue? Uh, a little. This is definitely 100% from my era of uh, comic book reading. And not to jump the gun, but the artwork and the cover – immediately kicked me back to childhood 100 yeah. percent. this was my era 100 percent. this marvel this style and again i don't mean to jump the gun but the easter exit which of course wasn't called back then but uh all the marvel touches are in this comic from the classic marvel era in my opinion they're all here every single one of them so uh <laughs> yeah i was i was to answer your question more directly i was familiar with iron fist i had read some issues I vaguely knew his story. I was a little surprised by what I got wrong in my memory. I was a little surprised by that, but that too will unfold over the course of the podcast. But basically, I did remember Iron Fist. I did remember liking it and um, the whole style and everything that it was was written and and, uh, inked in and everything. But uh, definitely, I, I I was not a, like, hardcore fan of Iron Fist. We did not have a lot uh, in the house, but what we did have, I did read. The creators here for this issue are Chris Claremont and John Byrne, of yeah, course. Uh, yeah, from the Uncanny X-Men. This is right before uh, Claremont was actually doing the X-Men the same time he was doing Iron Fist. He started. Oh, what a difference. Uh, <laughs> the book yeah, a little bit of a difference. <laughs> uh, but he started on Uncanny X-Men with issue 94 in August of 75. And he had started doing Iron Fist stories in 75 as well. And John Byrne, he didn't come into the X-Men until 77, until this Iron Fist series we're doing today ended its run, and then he joined the X-Men. Jank, did you have a long history with Iron Fist? Uh, No. I mean, again, I've obviously been familiar with Iron Fist. I've seen him pop up here and there, probably most notably when he took over for Daredevil in, like, the Ed oh, Brubaker yeah. run while uh, Matt Murdock was in jail, and he needed somebody to fill in as Daredevil on the streets. And maybe like in New Avengers, I feel like he was in there a little bit because obviously Luke Cage was a big part of that. So 
feel like he popped in and out of that book for a little while, but uh, I wouldn't say I've ever read any, if yeah, probably any solo Iron Fist stories. I mean, I watched the series, unfortunately. Yeah, you're so. a big fan of the Netflix series, Iron Fist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I deliberately skirted that topic. <laughs> did, did you watch that, Miles? I actually did watch some of it because when it came out, there was a certain amount of buzz. And I don't know if you're what, – what year was that? I remember the buzz all being negative. Uh, it was probably yeah. Yeah. 17, 17, 18. Yeah, yeah. somewhere around there. Okay, and as, and as strange as this may seem, because that, that's only like five years ago, that was a very different time in the history of like streaming service television. Yeah. There was a different like there was there was still a lot of enthusiasm and kind of like <laughs> joy and kind of like, oh, awe about what, uh, you know, everything that was on Netflix and everything that was being made on Amazon. Like you had you had all these shows coming out that were were everybody that people were buzzing. There was some good stuff like HBO did Chernobyl and like there was all this kind of like there was a belief with true detective and that there were the, these all sorts of stories that were kind of perpendicular to the traditional Hollywood mold of making TV and, and that there was going to be this new golden era of absolute quality. And mm-hmm. I think iron fist was the first real intimation that that was wrong. <laughs> it was real punch in the jeans. You know, iron fist, right? yeah. <laughs> it was March, 2017 is when it had its premiere. What I remember, I watched episode one of it. I didn't think it was too terrible. Uh, no. But I, I remember thinking the kid who played Iron Fist was completely unbelievable as yeah. a kung fu master. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm a middle aged shut in who likes cats. I should not be built better than Iron Fist. When I saw when I looked at the cast of Iron Fist, I remember because I checked it out and there, and there was a lot of buzz on it. And like Jake said, you know, buzz wasn't great. But I was like, that doesn't mean anything, you know, because. But then I was like, what? these casting choices, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah, like it just I mean, made Colleen no Wing, to, to be fair, that was good casting. I thought she was good. Yeah, yeah but you yeah, need your main guy to be a guy, though, like someone. Oh, this guy yeah. can beat me up. No one's looking at that yeah. Iron Fist yeah. and saying, oh, this guy can't beat up anybody. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I mean, Iron Fist uh, isn't that jacked. He's kind of, you know, thin. But he's a master Why of me? the Kung Fu, you know? Yeah. Right. Like, But if you watch, like, Above the Law, Steven Seagal was scrawny. His arms were about 11 inches around. He was not, you know, he wasn't a, he wasn't muscular at all. But he, also he was, was a terrible very fighter. dangerous in that <laughs> in that film. He gave off the, the impression of being extremely lethal. You know, like, Chuck Norris wasn't a big guy. And he, he was yeah. fit, but he wasn't ripped. You know what I mean? Like, it, you don't have to be like a monster. You don't have to go into that commando Rambo bullshit. But you have to have an lady. edge to you, you know? You yeah, you've got to have a yeah, charisma. You problem. have a dark yeah. charisma. You've got to have a, an ascent that, yeah, that you're that you're a badass or that you're dangerous or unstable or something going on for you that you're mean. And, and if, you're, if your hero doesn't have that, you know, it doesn't it just comes off as like this is a joke. Like this isn't realistic. This isn't somebody I can get behind. Yeah, one of Iron Fist's uh, big taglines, he's like a living weapon, you know? And that kid was not a living weapon. He was not a weapon. <laughs> no. But, uh, yeah, he's anyway. Like a living hippie. All right, before we get into the story, let's remind everybody, if you're uh, watching us on the YouTubes, please like and subscribe. We're up to 60 subscribers, Jank. 60 Ooh. subscribers. And more than we had last week, I think. Join the Flea Army or the Flea Circus. Either one flea works. Circus. Get on board. Yeah. Hey, Miles, are you subscribing? You need to subscribe to the show over on YouTube, Miles. Come on, you can be 61. Yeah, to 61, yeah. You know what? You know what? I'm going to do that right now. If I nice. Have hours, right. Made a sale. We're actually, the tipper. we're actually getting comments on the videos and stuff now. And uh, well, our buddy uh, Mike right. Rodden, who's a, a uh, LCS show listener, uh, commented on Death's Head. So, yeah, look at that. We're, uh, we're taking over the world. So thanks to everybody watching and commenting. And thanks to you, Miles, for finally subscribing. Whoa, whoa. Here we go. Oh. 50 subscribers. Subscribe. Nice, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Earlier today, I looked and we had sixty-one, and someone came to their senses and left. So, <laughs> but Miles here's, here's fills that void. Though. So, thank you. Now that I'm here, I'm going to trash all the podcasts really bad in the comments, especially mine. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be like, "Don't please. bring that scumbag on again. He makes me want to puke. I hate him. <laughs> he sucks. He's nearly as bad as Alf." No, no, no. Don't take shots at Alf. All right, so let's get into the Iron Fist. Uh, here, here we we'll give you the backstory here on the uh, Danny Rand. That's his name, you know, the Iron Fist. And uh, his first appearance was a Marvel premiere, issue 15, 1974. And he was created by Roy Thomas and Gil Kane. I, I did not realize Gil Kane was involved in the creation of Iron Fist. So that's nice. Oh, sure. I don't doubt it. Well, you don't have to doubt it. It's a fact. <laughs> it's a proven fact. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know who I, you could have told me anybody. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> sure. 
But uh, Marvel created Iron Fist and Shang-Chi to cash in on the kung fu craze of the early 1970s. Miles Watson, we're 70s children. Uh, were you a part of the kung fu craze of the early 70s? I was, kind of. I was always super intrigued by Count Dante advertisements. Oh, the yeah. Back of, the, uh, <laughs> of the back of the comic books about how the, the Death Black Touch. Dragon Fighting Society and the, the Dim Mock Death yeah. Punch. And Such a death. I <laughs> thank God for YouTube because I was ultimately able to learn the full story of Count Dante. And it is far, far weirder and more disturbing than you could ever hope. We should, we so should discuss just, that some week on LCS. Yeah. I'll, I'll, get in yeah. I'll just leave it at that. If you if you ever have a chance to go down that rabbit hole of Count Dante, you must do it. Yeah, very famous <laughs> comic book advertisement back in the day. One of my earliest childhood memories, Miles, was uh, jumping around my basement to the song Kung Fu Fighting. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, they, ca- they created Iron Fist to cash in on just that craze. And Roy Thomas said he got the name Iron Fist from the Kung Fu movie King Boxer, a.k.a. The Five Fingers of Death, 1972. Sounds like a pretty good movie. We should watch that sometime. <laughs> and then uh, he and Gil Kane created the character together, drawing inspiration from Bill Everett's character, John Amon, The Amazing Man, which was first published in 1939. Because of that character, it's he was kind of similar to Iron Fist in the fact that he was trained in the Himalayas by a bunch of monks, and he got like kind of superpowers. And, of course, that story was even inspired by uh, James Hilton's 1933 novel, Lost Horizon, which introduced the mystical city of Shangri-La. Miles, did you ever read uh, Lost Horizon? I did not. I don't think I've ever even heard of it, to be honest. Oh, I have read it. It's very good. You should check it out. Yeah, it's good stuff. But instead of Shangri-La and the Iron Fist stories, the ancient city is called Kunlun. K-U-N-L-U-N. Kunlun. Rolls so right off the tongue. Yeah, and it, it is a pocket dimension in the Himalayas that can be accessed once every 10 years. I can't remember the last time I accessed the pocket dimension. <laughs> but the Iron Fist protects the entrance. I feel like they've stretched that story-wise. I feel like they're always going to Kunla, and it definitely yeah. has not been 10 years. Like These guys would yeah. be a lot older. But Iron Fist, uh, it's like a lineal thing, kind of like the Black Panther down in uh, you know Wakanda. Like The Iron Fist is the protector of Kunlun, so there's been many Iron Fists over the years. The city itself was founded by humanoid aliens who crashed their ship in that very pocket dimension one million years ago. And they they created the city around their crashed spaceship. But this pocket dimension, the natives, the uh, actual inhabitants of this dimension is a race of plant based creatures called the Hill Three. I don't know. H apostrophe Y L T H R I. Hill Three? Does that sound right? Hill Three. Yeah, why not? But they're a very aggressive species, and they are sworn enemies of the humans who live there. They're, they're kind of like weeds that keep growing up. They're trying to take over the city, you know, and the humans got to beat them back. And the Iron Fist has to protect the city from these plant-based creatures. And they come in later, so remember those plant-based creatures. You'd but, think uh, they'd get like a, like a fire guy to be their protector <laughs> instead of just a guy with a fist. Like, he can take out all those plants in two seconds. Jack, did you ever hear of this history of Kunlun with the plant creatures and aliens and everything? I never heard yeah. that. I thought there were just some monks up there. <laughs> studying was dragons and stuff. Like, yeah. Not, not well, plants. there was an immortal dragon, the Shao Lao. <laughs> Shao Lao, the immortal dragon. But he wasn't very immortal because he, he died at some point or something. Um, <laughs> uh, because uh, I think Iron Fist He was him. only immortal for a limited time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like open 24 <laughs> hours, but not in a row. You know, all right. But uh, Thomas got the idea for the dragon brand on Iron Fist's chest from a Western comic character named Bullseye, created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. And the reason Iron Fist has that dragon scar is Danny Ran had to defeat Shao Lao, the immortal dragon, to become the Iron Fist. During battle, he noticed that the uh, the dragon had like a scar on his chest. And it seemed to be like he was drawing power from some mystical gem or something through the scar. So he jumped and hugged the dragon around the belly to block the scar with his chest. <laughs> and eventually the dragon collapsed. But when he uh, he pulled himself off, he had the big dragon scar on his chest now. So that's how he got it. That's how you got your scar, right, Jack? He was pulling himself. Yeah, pulling myself off. That's exactly how I got that scar. <laughs> <laughs> so Iron Fist first appeared in Marvel Premiere issue 15, and he ran there until issue 25. That led to his own solo series in 1975, which lasted 15 issues. That's what we're reading here today. And after the series was canceled, some loose ends got tied up in Marvel Team-Up 63 and 64, which also oh, featured... Oh, uh, I was worried. 
Yeah, <laughs> that storyline featured Danny Rand kissing Misty Knight, and it was the Whoa. first interracial kiss in Marvel Comics history. It was the first interracial relationship in Marvel history, and the first relationship where the woman was older than the man. The hat hmm. trick for uh, okay. Danny Rand. Misty Knight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at them. Trailblazers. And we'll get into uh, his backstory with his family and everything. It's discussed in this issue. So we'll just get to it then. So after he did the Marvel team up stuff with Misty Knight there for those two issues, Luke Cage was also struggling at the time. His uh, power band series wasn't selling so good. So they said, hey, you know what? Let's make him a tag team. Let's put Iron yeah. Fist in there with him. That so, was a good idea. Yeah, it was. So Iron Fist joined up in issue 48 and 49. And then for issue 50, the series was retitled Power Man and Iron Fist. And that was in 1978. And then the series ran until issue 125 in 1986. Now, Jank, are you aware of the big event that happened when that series ended? No, I don't know. Iron Fist died. Whoa. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people know that. But uh, the writer at the time was Jim (laughs) Owsley, who, of course, is known as Christopher Priest these days. He came up with the idea of there's this kid who apparently was a uh, I don't know, hit by aliens or something <laughs> like a ship landed on him or a meteor gave him some superpowers or something. I don't know. His name was Bobby Wright and he could change into a superhero called Captain Hero. Huh, that's All right. Worst name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah. I think that was actually they, a character. They really, really pushed the envelope on that one. <laughs> so this kid, <laughs> he wanted to join heroes for hire with Power Man and Iron Fist. And they said, well, we can't let you do that because you're a kid and your name's really stupid. Captain Hero. That's dumb. <laughs> so we're not going to let you join the team. So he, he kept uh, palling around with him or something. But then this kid got really sick. And uh, uh, they, they thought something was going wrong with, like, his alien radiation or something. I don't know. So uh, Iron the Fist. Wish they let him join the team? No, no, no. So he, he's <laughs> in the hospital, this kid, and Iron Fist is trying to heal him with his chi. Because that's how Iron Fist, he can, uh, you know, focus his chi to charge yeah. up his Iron Fist. I should have said when he killed that dragon, that's when he first became the Iron Fist, because then he, he he punched his fist into, like, the, the dragon's molten heart, and that gave him huh. the Iron Fist ability. I mean, that seems weird that there has been multiple Iron Fists throughout the years and only one dragon. So well, cool. it's it's very <laughs> it's very convoluted. Like, that dragon had died, and that, that heart, his heart was ripped out and melted down and put into, like, a, uh, I don't know, a box. I don't know. And so whenever anyone to become an Iron Fist, you have to beat the dragon in combat, even though he's like a dead dragon. When you do that, then you get to put your fist in the molten heart. And that's how I'll give you the power. They have definitely I, I know in recent years, they've gone back and shown all these old timey Avengers. And there's been an Iron Fist like since Primordial Man. Yeah, this is the whole thing. So it's not yeah, like well, Danny Rand killed the dragon and then they got this heart. No, but apparently you the heart's always been there like this dragon. He's not the first guy to fight that dragon. See what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's why he was the immortal combat. dragon, because I guess they've been yeah. fighting him for uh, It's a very long story. A million <laughs> he takes, years. He a lot of punches to the heart. That's yes. why he's immortal. But anyway, getting back to this kid and Captain Hero, he's in the hospital. Iron Fist is trying to heal him with his chi. And then uh, Hank Pym comes up with some quantum band sort of things for the kid to wear, because they think that might help him can like heal him or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, Iron Fist gets all tired and sleepy. He falls asleep in the chair next to the kid. It looks like the kid's going to be okay. But then the kid wakes up and he's flipping out. And he's like, ah, my, I'm in so much pain. And Iron Fist isn't waking up. He's so tired. And the kid starts flipping out. He's, he's tearing up his hospital room. All the nurses are sleeping, I guess. Everyone, this is a terrible hospital. <laughs> but then uh, the kid turns into extra. Captain Hero. And he's like, hey, Iron Fist, wake up, wake up. And to wake him up, he just punches him in the chest repeatedly. And, and it kills Iron Fist. It knocks him through the wall. And he, that's how Iron Fist dies. And then and then Captain Hero, Ow. he just dissolves. Like, he bursts into the particles and dies. And so Luke Cage goes in to see what's going on with his buddy, uh, you know, Iron Fist. He's like, holy hell, Iron Fist is dead. And then the cops come in to interview uh, Luke Cage about what happened. And, you know, he's like, well, some kid, Captain Hero, killed him. And then he disappeared. And they're like, all right, sure thing, Luke Cage. And they want to arrest him for murdering Iron Fist. And so <laughs> Luke Cage has to go on the lamb. And he, he goes off. And that's how the series uh-huh. ends. With Luke Cage running from oh, the law, man. being suspected of killing Iron Fist. Oh, that's that's so, quite the ending. That actually <laughs> sounds like the series finally got interesting. <laughs> and now you're going to end it? <laughs> well, here's uh, Jim Owsley, what he said about this. Uh, this I took this from Wikipedia, so you know it's got to be true. Uh, quote, Fist's death was senseless and shocking and completely unforeseen. It took the reader's heads clean off 
And to this day, people are mad about it, <laughs> forgetting it seems that, A, you were supposed to be mad, that death is senseless and fist death was supposed to be senseless, or that, B, this is a comic book. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. Really He'll be back in three months anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, death means nothing in comics or science fiction. Uh, I seem to remember Venom being killed uh, uh, very decisively. Everyone's been killed. Every week Back on this show, we talk about people and, being killed. Uh, yeah, and that last day. And everybody was praising uh, Marvel because they killed Venom, and they're like, wow, that was bold. He was so popular, and you guys killed him off. Wow, wow. And I'm kidding. <laughs> it was like three <laughs> weeks later before they brought him back. Yeah, everyone always yep. comes back. Because I don't know if you guys will believe this, but that Iron Fist, he was killed. Turns out he was an imposter. Of course he was. That's right. So <laughs> the Helena he Cassidyne of comic book <laughs> killed 57 times on General Hospital always he, comes back a week later. He was actually one of those plant creatures. Uh, he'll lift oh, around. Oh, of course. He, he was, was <laughs> pretending to be Iron Fist. And Iron Fist was kept in a like a water sack cocoon in that plant dimension or whatever, wherever they live. And this was all revealed in 1991. Yeah, kind of like the Phoenix thing, yeah. This was all <laughs> revealed in the pages of Namor the Submariner, issues 21 through 25 in 1991. That series was, of course, uh, written and drawn by John Byrne. He liked Iron Fist, mm -hmm. so he wanted to bring Iron Fist back. But yeah, Iron Fist was gone. For, I had yeah, no idea. a long time. I know, I had no Me idea. <laughs> his, his presence was felt so little that I guess no one noticed when he wasn't there. So, yeah, now apparently that kid, you know, the Captain Hero kid, it gets even weirder because he was actually the Super Skrull. <laughs> okay. But, but, he, but the Super Skrull had no idea that he was the Super Skrull because his memory got wiped. And this is all a big plan by a guy named Master Chan, who is one of Iron Fist's villain, like, arch enemies. Or Master Yeah, Kong. this is another problem with Iron Fist. It's like when you're – Master, your arch enemy is a guy named Master Chan. Like, well, I think it's Khan. You need a, I may have, a better rogues gallery. I may have had the wrong yeah. name. I believe it's Master Khan. Either way. <laughs> Either one. Yeah. Not the best. <laughs> so anyway, after he came back in the pages of Namor, he uh, he popped up in Marvel Comics Presents. He had uh, for a couple of runs there, I think. And then he started getting his own series. And there's been a bunch of Iron Fist and Power Man series since then. So, uh -huh. But he, he's back. There was a Heroes for Hire series in the 90s. I remember the last of a little while. Had like a rotating team, but him and Power Man were kind of the core of it. And uh, we mentioned earlier Chris Claremont. He did the Marvel premiere issues of Iron Fist, issues 23 through 25. Then he did all 15 of this series. John Byrd did Marvel premiere 25, and then he drew all 15 issues of this series. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. So without this series, we, we probably don't get Claremont and Byrd on X-Men. Yeah, that's it's crazy. crazy. Uh, Miles, do you feel crazy. enlightened now that you've learned so much about Iron Fist? I'm a little bewildered by the uh, backstory, to be honest. I I thought it was much <laughs> more of a of a straightforward backstory. Yes, like, so did guy I. learns kung fu, <laughs> beats up criminals on streets of New York. But no, there are aliens and plant creatures and all kind of weird stuff. I, I kind of like my version better, but yeah, I know. I don't know how I feel about all this. I'm just gonna pretend. He's just a guy who learned Kung Fu, and he punches people in the face. <laughs> That's how I want to go with it. I'm comfortable. That's really all you need. All right, so, Jank, uh, let's look at the cover here. This is issue eight again from 1976. Pretty great cover by John Byrne. Yeah. <laughs> Can't really fault the cover. The cover was good, so I can kind of see why you picked this one, <laughs> because of yeah. the cover alone. Um, we got the Marvel Comics group across the top. It says Iron Fist next to that, so they want you to – I guess no, because the giant Iron Fist wasn't enough. Yeah. They got to put it next to the uh, Marvel Comics group as well. Uh, we got him in the little corner box, kind of doing his yoga uh, with, his, with his fist energy. And uh, <clears throat> we get the Iron Fist logo, which is very Iron Man-esque with even yes. like, rivets in the letters and stuff. That's like what that. Roy Thomas said when he came up with the idea for Iron Fist. He said, is it too much like Iron Man? But Stan Lee liked it, so they went with it. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's good luck. But then it's basically a red background with, you know, the action lines on it and just Iron Fist punching the, the, the reader in the face, basically. Yeah. Why do you assume he's punching you in the face? Yeah, right in the jeans. Yeah. He'll do oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Miles, how do you feel about this? Very short. I like the cover. I actually, I've, I've been pretty critical of a lot of the covers that, that we've done when I've been a guest on here. I like this cover. It's very direct. It's straightforward. This style, the the 
heavy ink shadow, bright color style of this. Uh, I'm not my descriptive powers on on art are not the best, obviously, but I like it. It's simple. It's direct. It's straightforward. The orange rind around his hand, that glow of energy. I don't know. Maybe that wasn't the greatest color with a red background. But other than that, I like it. You got the green. You got the yellow, gold, the red background, the white and blue iron fist. There's a lot of color in the title. I like it. I think it's, it would make it better. Uh, it he's, in he's getting your attention. Uh, Jank, don't they usually make his fist glow like gold? Uh, I feel like I've seen it every which way. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah. Maybe describe the costume for the kids uh, listening to the audio version of this who have never seen Iron Fist. I like the outfit. I think yeah. it's a cool outfit. Uh, okay. We'll go with that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's basically got one of those do-rag masks t- tied over his, yeah. his face. And his it nose. is a do-rag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yellow. Uh, it's yellow, yep. Kind of got Wolverine-esque eyes going on there uh, with black eyes kind of going around the eyes, slits. Um, good, good observation. Yeah, yeah, a little bit like that. Yeah, because it's not that's not just shadow. That's kind of on the mask, right? Yeah, yeah, those are those are part of it, part of the look. And uh, then because he's got that cool dragon tattoo, he's got to show it off. So yeah. he's got like a like a open you know V neck type of uh, suit going on. So you can see that sweet sweet chest, and it, he's completely hairless. So you know, <laughs> a lot of shade to show off that tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then he's got kind of big flared out yellow collar, um, and the rest of the outfit's mostly green. Uh, no gloves, just just bare fists. Yeah. Uh, he's got a yellow sash tied around his waist as like a belt, uh, not like a utility belt or anything because it can't hold anything. It's just there to to be a sash, I guess. <laughs> yep. It's like a yellow <laughs> belt. Throw it. Yeah. <laughs> you can toss it around when he wants to feel sassy. Uh, and he's got yellow boots on. Well, little or slippers, kind of just right? Slippers, yeah. Yeah, yeah not like even a ballet play. dancer. <laughs> yeah, because he's got to be graceful. Yep. Those things don't really pack much of a punch. They probably just cushion the blow a little bit, but whatever. <laughs> I, I think it's a good look. All right, yeah. so uh, we open up the book. Uh, you were born Daniel Rand. At the age of nine, your life was shattered by the murder of your father. Hey, guess what? His mom also died. Can't yeah. mention that. Oh well. <laughs> I guess the elements got her, so who cares? No, the wolves Can't got her. That yeah, <laughs> the wolves true. got her. Well, nature got her. <laughs> <laughs> she threw herself on wolves to protect uh, Danny. Uh, at 19, <laughs> you emerged from the mystic city of Kunlun, reborn in the fires of the dragon's heart. Yours are the most finely honed martial arts skills in the world. You were born Daniel Ran. You have since changed. All right, that would have been. I thought I was expecting a more uh, powerful ending there. Like you were born Daniel <laughs> Rand, now you are the Iron Fist. But no, you have since changed, and that's how it ends. I yeah, then since the Iron Fist, the living legend or living weapon. <laughs> yeah. And so, thinking. all right, uh, Jack, how about this uh, opening splash page here? This is pretty great. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, splash page. We got Iron Fist kind of. In profile, he's got his hand up. Uh, I don't know what he's doing there, making weird shadow making puppets or something. He's making a fist. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird looking fist. That's like well, because that fist has seen fist. some stuff. You know, it's that's a damaged yeah. fist. It's been through some wars. You know, yeah. So he's got a carpal tunnel going on. He's had a couple uh, boxing fractures there. It looks like. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird looking. But then, kind of uh, superimposed in that on the right side, we got uh, some. Some Chinese thugs are shaking down some subway goers, and one of them looks suspiciously like John Byrne, which I noticed right away. I was like, that looks like John Byrne. <laughs> yeah, because I'll say this. Uh, I read ahead in issue 15 that there's an X-Men crossover in this series, and in that issue, there's a party scene where Claremont and Byrne are both featured. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. So I don't know if there was like a ga- like a recurring joke they had where they'd put each other in the book as they were going, but... That seems to be the case here. And yeah. Miles, look at the Golden Tigers. They got pretty swanky uh, leather jackets with a giant tiger head on the back. They do. <laughs> Pissed off looking tiger at that. I like Rocky too. When Rocky got yeah. all that money and bought that tiger jacket. <laughs> Although now I I I didn't notice the fist when I first read this. That what is that mutated hand that he's got? <laughs> he has a, a boxing fracture there. He like you know boxing fracture. It looks like a tank <laughs> ran over his hand. Yeah, it's, uh, his hand's been through some stuff, you know. <laughs> Don't worry about it. He's 
become the elephant man, apparently, at oh. least in the hand. I'm more concerned about the young lady there next to John Byrne, her lower legs, uh, particularly her left leg. There seems to be an issue there. <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe John Byrne likes his ladies with a weird leg. <laughs> weird legs and weird hands <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but this issue is called, like, Tigers in the Night. So then we op- uh, open past the splash page and we see the the gangster there, the uh, the Golden Tigers gang member. He's trying to uh, shake them down. But here comes a cop, protect and serve, you know. He's going to come in there, save the day. But then, Miles, w- what happens to the cop? He gets his ass kicked, but in an unusual way. Uh, <laughs> the gangbanger hits him with the ubiquitous, and I remember the throwing star craze of the 80s because I was part of it. <laughs> yes. Hits him with a throwing star. My, my, my arm! He gets uh, hit in the wrist. With a throwing star, there's no blood, interestingly enough, which, you know. It just bounces off, just ricochets off his arm. <laughs> yeah, it actually would have, you know, if, if anything, it would have torn his, his wrist open. Then he gets his ass knocked down, and he's about to get his head blown off with his own gun. So this cop's having a bad day. So he's about to shoot the cop, but then Jank Iron Fist comes in. This is a pretty great panel. I noticed in this issue, John Byrne does a lot of splash pages. Yeah. And this is a great one. I guess when you're doing kung fu action, you got to show it off. There will be no yeah, funerals, butcher, except perhaps for you. <laughs> and he comes jumping in, yeah. kicks the dude in the nice face. Kick. Yeah, pretty awesome. And then we get a sequence, another big splash page of Iron Fist uh, flying through the scene here. This is something that Frank Miller did a lot with Daredevil, where he have several images of the action, but only like one or two would be actually colored solid and the others will be yeah. like uh yeah like a lighter uh, images. Yeah. yeah yeah so i thought it was pretty cool to see this here but he's tearing through all the gang members flipping through kicking them in the face and whatnot but uh then one guy cuts some jank yeah that's right uh that's right. It's my arm you uh he's, yeah, he's got a knife and he just kind of cuts him i guess in the shoulder a little bit or the back maybe yeah, yeah. Looks like this is the night old Chen Yu bags himself a superhero. <laughs> yeah, cocky. But then Iron Fist just breaks his arm, kind of, and then punches him in the yeah. face. <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, we're the best our fucking, our clan has to offer. We're the best fighters we have. So Iron Fist beat us this easily. Like, we're screwed. But luckily for them, Iron Fist didn't hear a train coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. The yeah. dialogue here is absolutely a subway train. He, he's astonished <laughs> that subway? on a subway platform, a subway train. <laughs> and then he says, I, I, I just have to say this. I'd better gather them all together and summon the police too. Eh? A subway train? I was concentrating <laughs> on the fight so much that I didn't hear its approach. Dude, have you ever been on any subway? Yeah, you'll hear it. I, they're loud, dude. You hear them coming a long way off. And uh, And guess what? Here's another thing. You expect subway trains on in your subway. <laughs> but it snuck <laughs> up on him. I also like how he's saying that all out loud. That's it. That isn't his internal yeah. monologue. He's speaking his words. And then the gang member, he's distracted by the train. This is my chance. And he kicks Iron Fist back into the train. And then, like, the train spits him into, like, the side of the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so he hits that shoulder. I guess that he got cut in, you know, right into the steel now. And then people come off the train and dig all the uh, bell-bottom pants. In yeah, and fashions. look at the design on the pants with the shoes and the two-tone <laughs> denim, the toes. Shoes. I, I really like yeah. that. That's a really nice touch. And, oh, no, the, the subway passengers crowding around me, hemming me in. Yeah, he's he's he had him to get up because people are just walking over him. <laughs> like, get away <laughs> from me. You useless hump. That's actually very authentic to New York. You, you get off a subway <laughs> platform. There's a guy in a yellow and green costume who's been stabbed lying on the ground, and you just walk over the guy and keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, this weirdo in a golden green outfit. But, yeah, he's saying, again, he's saying these words out loud. Get away from me, all of you. I've got to get up. <laughs> Those men are gone, young dragon. <laughs> he, he talks to himself <laughs> in third person as young dragon. Yeah. And he always thinks, like, he calls himself Iron Fist, too. Like, get up, Iron Fist. Like, <laughs> it's weird. Like, we know you're Iron Fist. Like, why do you have to keep thinking it every time? You reestablishing it for the audience every five seconds because we have that short of an attention span. So then the media shows up and they're reporting on things, and uh, the cops show up. And Iron Fist, I guess, is buddies with some of these guys because the one cop gives him some tea, <laughs> so that's nice. <laughs> he knows his tea order too. He's like, "Yeah, lemon with uh, no milk, no sugar." 
guy comes over and oh, this is Raphael's the cop. Uh, he's uh like Daredevil's dealt with that guy in the past, right? Raphael, I think that seems I familiar. No, no. But anyway, they get a drawing of the gang members. Oh yeah, because uh, he says there's a guy named Raphael. That guy Burn, who was attacked, happens to be an artist. <laughs> he sketched us the gang's emblem. He's doing their yeah, faces yeah. now. Uh, that cop also looks a little like Abe Vigoda, fish on Barney Miller. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. Fish, a little bit. My boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. J- John yeah. Byrne is uh, definitely the guy who got mugged there. And, my uh, God, he does look like Abe Vigoda. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. We also get a very quick uh, Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson cameo here. Oh. I really enjoyed that. That's right. I forgot all yeah. about that. Explain it, Jay. Um, one of the cops is asking, you got an ID, kid? And he says, Parker of the Bugle, I'm on assignment. And Mary Jane says, no, he isn't. We're on a date. <laughs> and that's about it. But also, it looks like Peter Parker's wearing a Captain America shirt. Like, yeah. <laughs> He's throwing people off the track, I guess. Yeah. People only yeah, suspect I really like that. I, I always I would like to interject and say that one thing I, I always really enjoyed about Marvel back in the day was that they were very clever. They did Easter eggs and things of that nature before that was a, before there was a term for it. They love to interweave little cameos, have people in the background, have one hero bump into another hero from another series and he's like get out of my way you jerk and it's like wolverine you know going to get a beer and they were really really good and clever with that and they like to overlap they always like to make you feel like that universe was very immersive and that new york especially was overrun with superheroes you know you had the avengers there and you had the fantastic four there you had spider-man there you had like all these all these guys were based out of new york like so many of the uh of yeah. the comic book heroes and they they like to have them bump into each other and run into each other and i always thought that was cool that's what i got a kick out of that now it's kind of just accepted as like easter eggs are just i hate the term fan service but it is kind of fan service but i think they did it for a different reason i think they did it out of love for for the universe and and stuff like that, I think they they were trying to make it seem like when you picked it up, yeah. you, you didn't know what you know you were gonna you were gonna run into some of your buddies. Like you live in a small town, you go to the mall and there you, you run into some of your, some guys from school. Yeah. Lord knows in New York, you always see people you know. It's a very <laughs> tiny place, it's a very tiny <laughs> city of eight million. Yeah, but but have you noticed that like in Marvel, they generally pack everything into Manhattan. Like there's a little bit of like. Queens or you know Brooklyn like I think auntie I think I think Peter Parker's aunt lives in Queens but like the Force vast majority of them live somewhere in Manhattan so we cut now to a uh a fella Jack what's this guy's name oh it's Bill Howe H-A-O Bill Howe and we know that's his name because he refers to himself by his name when he's thinking in his mind <laughs> yeah. the dialogue here is excellent <laughs> at all times <laughs> would you like to read some of it Jack So Bill Howe, who has a very personal reason for destroying the Tigers, their leader is Robert Howe, my brother. And this young lady slipping so furtively down Pell Street is Cynthia Wu, suspected by the police of belonging to the Tigers' female auxiliary. So I guess this is like the pink ladies of the uh, the Tigers. (laughs) Yeah. And again, this is his his like internal thoughts. This isn't like an overall narration of what's happening. This is this guy thinking. Yeah. Very strange. He's, he's going to follow this lady back to their hideout so he can go find his brother. Uh, and then he's kind of like, oh, I'm surprised that my brother's actually here. I wish I'd never found this. Like, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> he followed her for sp- specifically that reason. But, yeah, so his brother's like the leader of the Golden Tigers, I guess. He wants to help bring him down because he knows he's not doing a, he's not a good fellow there. And the Golden Tiger, Tigers, they want to get uh, Joy Meacham. She is the Isn't niece, it? Danny Rand's father's business partner, who killed his father, who killed Danny's father and mother. And we'll get into that here in a couple pages. That girl steps in and she starts uh, questioning uh, the leader there, the Golden Tigers. She says, hey, we can fight just as good as you, you know. And he just smacks her across the face. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, you're a good fighter. You couldn't, get, you couldn't even avoid that slap. What are you talking about? <laughs> And I like he throws now, in shut a nice misogynistic comment there, too. <laughs> yeah, shut your woman's mouth and get out yeah. of here. Yeah, your woman mouth. And, of course, she's, like, you know, she's, like, cringing, holding her face. Yeah, she she gets, she gets like, the real villain treatment. And then that, the uh, the Bill fella, he's, like, he's thinking, you are mad, brother, and these dreams of yours can only end in death and dishonor. I am sorry, Robert, but I must stop. What? And then uh, someone behind him says, evening, Mr. Howe, looking for your brother. And then we cut away from that, and we don't come back to that at all this issue, right? 
I don't think that gets picked no. up. No. Haven't no, they put it down. Here. At the end, I think it might have been nice to just put a little thing at the end, like, next issue, see what happened to the Bill Howard. Because, I mean, everyone's going to forget that even happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's why they didn't bother. They're like, no one's coming back for that. <laughs> not getting anyone's 30 cents because you were promised the ending of Mr. Howe. <laughs> I wanted to see what happened to Bill Howe. All right, so we get to uh, Iron Fist. He's uh, hanging out in his, uh, I guess, luxury penthouse apartment there. And uh, just a bathrobe, no pants. It's a little weird. He, he starts flashing back to his childhood, and he's seeing ghostly images. Because this is his childhood home, I guess. He just recently moved back into it. And he's seeing him as a boy. And his mom's yelling at him for, like, you know, playing in the house. And he broke that vase. You know, little creep. You know? That was the anniversary present, damn it. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and he sees his dad, you know. And then, oh, look, then he sees his dad and mom making out. That's a little weird that he's remembering that. Yeah. That's a little strange. <laughs> it's burned into his brain, apparently. <laughs> but then he's remembering their trip. Because his dad, when he was a child, he stumbled upon Kun Loon. And he, he learned a little bit, some stuff, you know, about the city. But then when he came back into the, uh, you know, the normal world, he became this entrepreneur and this successful businessman. But when uh, it was 10, he knew the 10 year window was coming up when they could access Kunlun again. So he wanted to go on expedition. He took, you know, because when you're going on a dangerous expedition in the Himalayas, what you want to do is take your wife and nine year old son. That's really what you want to do. Yep. And uh, you also take your business partner. So when they're, uh, you know, the weather's terrible up there and they're making their way through the Himalayas, uh, the business partner I think maybe little Danny slipped and fell and was hanging off a cliff or something. And then uh, the yeah. business partner shoved his dad off the cliff and killed his dad. Yeah. And then uh, the wolves just appeared out of nowhere and started mo- coming for Danny. And his mom says, no, no, save, run, Danny, run. And he runs across the little bridge and his mom dives in front of the wolves and the wolves eat her. And then he makes it to the mystical city of Kunlun and they take him in and raise him as their own. Harold Meacham, he starts to make his way down the mountain. But I guess he succumbs to the weather, and they eventually find him, but he has to have his legs amputated. But then when he comes back to the U.S., he takes over the uh, the business because he says, oh, yeah, my partner died up there. I didn't shove him off a cliff or anything. Why are you asking? Yeah. So now we see Joy Meacham, and this was uh, his niece, I think they said. She's not running the yeah, business. Yeah, I think that's right. He's like, there's going to be changes now that I'm in charge. And she wants to kill Iron Fist, right? Because Danny Rand's back, that means he has a, he's kind of, the business is rightfully his. Everyone thought he was dead, but oh, he's alive now, so he's an heir to the business. So we got to get rid of Danny Rand. We got to get that guy out of here. So she hires some guy. It looks like he's got a. He's never uh, declared the the wife and Danny Rand dead. So now they're able to come back and he's able to get his fortune back, theoretically. And she hires some guy. It looks like he also has a tattoo on his chest. Uh, yeah. yeah he I don't does. Know what's up with that guy? Looks like another he, Iron Fist. Yeah, he he. I'm suspecting this dude, in addition to being some kind of an assassin, is is trained in kung fu. Otherwise, I mean, he's just a terrible dresser. But if you're trained in kung yeah. fu, it's a cool <laughs> yeah. all right. So uh, now we see Danny Rand, and there's Misty Knight there, and oh, this is Hogarth, because in uh, in the TV shows, yeah. Hogarth is played by uh, what's her face, uh, Trinity from uh, The Matrix. Yeah, I can't remember her name. Carrie Ann Moss, right? Is that her name? Uh, yes, yeah. that's yeah, it. Yeah. But here it's a, it's like a guy who kind of looks like Boss Hog. <laughs> so oh, they should have got that for the show. That would have been better. So they have a big meeting down at the. I guess they're trying to do some sort of a deal with Joey Meacham, uh, who will run the business or something, right? Whether Danny's entitled to it. So they're having yeah, some important they business meeting. His legacy back. But when they go there for the big meeting, uh, uh, the Golden Tigers are coming in. They got the. Apparently they dress in bathrobes as well, which is a weird look. <laughs> Bathrobes and masks. That was bathrobe fighting. <laughs> so they're having their big meeting, and then, oh, no, the Golden Tigers bust in. It's Chaka, crime lord of New York. He's got a golden bathrobe, <laughs> so you know he's different. The other ones have blue ones. Danny Rand's thing, and they've got us cold. And as Danny Rand, I can't do a blasted thing. I'm helpless. And, <laughs> and then Misty Knight's reaching for her purse, and Hogarth says, Misty, for pity's sake, don't go for your gun now. No, this seems like the perfect time to go for your gun. <laughs> these uh, yeah. golden tigers, they don't even have weapons. They don't have knives. They don't have uh, swords. They don't have guns. They don't have nothing. They so don't Misty have Knight, pants. Yeah. <laughs> Misty Knight, go for your <laughs> gun immediately. That's what you want to do. Just so, start uh, mowing him down, yeah. Run to the other side of the room where it'll take him a while to get to you and start shooting. Uh, and you will either accede to my demands, Joy Meacham, or one by one, your friends and colleagues will all die. 
Next issue, a foggy night in Chinatown, a superhero ah. poisoned, and the only antidote rests at the end of a gauntlet of murderous martial artists in the hands of a man who has sworn Iron Fist's death. The dragon dies at midnight. That sounds like an issue. But it sounds like nothing connected that. to this whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> no. It doesn't even mention the, the boardroom thing that seems like the big setup for the next issue. No. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, maybe next issue, can Danny survive the Golden Tigers? That might be all you need. But instead, we get a description of something that sounds nothing related to this whatsoever. <laughs> Bold and choice. nothing about Bill Howe. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to know what happened to Bill Howe. That's what I'm <laughs> spending my 30 seconds. Well, you gotta, you got to read the next issue. Issue nine. Miles Watson. I uh, give it real quick, and apparently they just throw Iron or Danny Rand out the window, and that gives them the chance to yeah. switch into Iron Fist and pop oh. back in. So, <laughs> really? Is that really what happened? Yeah, <laughs> that's what happens. But Iron Fist can't that's, fly. That's <laughs> if they throw him out the window. <laughs> Flag pole or something. on the first floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, all right, there it is, issue eight of Iron Fist. And uh, Miles Watson, the writer here, is Chris Claremont. He's one of the most iconic comic book writers ever. Do you know who Chris Claremont is, Miles? I I know his style. I know he his had style a, well. He had a 16-year run on the X-Men. And, like, every, yeah. <laughs> every famous all, X-Men story, he wrote it. So. And, and I was going to say, when you brought up yeah. X-Men earlier, that was actually the thing that I was most reminded of in terms of some of the, the humor at the beginning of this comic, before it sort of lost its sense of humor. The beginning of this comic is <laughs> a number of funny remarks. And that was was a staple of the X-Men was witty banter and repartee between the X-Men, between Wolverine and Nightcrawler, between Cyclops and Wolverine. You know, like there were always these little jabs. There were always these little double entendres and smart ass remarks. There were always these Easter eggs and kind of these cracks about New York. And like there were in jokes and there was a lot of humor and of different nuances woven into the story and little jabs and little. And that's that's exactly what this reminds me of. Also, the artwork somewhat reminds me of some of the eras of X-Men that I read yeah. growing up. John Byrne did a lot of those, yeah. Um, yeah, so 100%, yes. This is not good Chris Claremont, though, Jack. This is oh. not good. <laughs> yeah, this is like later Chris Claremont, except it was early. So um, <laughs> I don't know yeah. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, the writing, especially at the beginning of the issue, I thought was really bad. Like, the dialogue was terrible, especially with, between, like, the cop and the, the dragons or the tigers there. Yeah, I, I did not like it. Um, and then it just kind of meandered in the middle and then finally came to an ending that looked like, oh, this is actually promising. So overall, I can't say that the writing was too strong for me. Just a lot of exposition in the dialogue. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the, one thing I, I can remember about his stuff was very dialogue box heavy. The exposition in this is is really hammer over the head obvious. It's like laughably bad. Not saying I didn't enjoy reading this because I actually did enjoy it, but the exposition is painful in the sense that they they try to I mean I know it's a comic and they don't have much room but there is something to be said for letting context unfold over different issues like you don't have to have the brother like give the whole history of his existence and <laughs> yeah. his thought as he's walking down an alley like that's it's not necessary to go that far you can drib and drab it out and still like you can still establish who he is and what his mission is but it's very like the entire thing, like the, the guys are they're not even thought bubbling when they're fighting on the subway platform. They're saying what's happening. I'm being thrown into a subway yeah. bluff. You know, like, it's like <laughs> what a subway it's car. Like, <laughs> if the Simpsons were parodying a, a comic book, that's the way they would write the dialogue. So, I mean, I almost feel like a lot of the dialogue and exposition here, not all of it, but a lot of it is, is really bad. Yeah, it's not not the best, not the best. Even uh, like when Iron Fist is fighting those guys early on, it and they have that cool scene of him, you know, taking everybody down in the big splash page. Like it has to then describe in narration boxes like everything that's happening. Like, oh, he kicks this guy in the face, and then he yeah. punches this guy in the belly. But you just, that's all in the artwork. You don't need yeah. a blow by blow in the in the narration as well. Yeah, let well, the artwork. Mike Dell, Mike Dell, as an editor, will tell you, uh, Jank, that one of the fundamental rules that they beat into your head. If you study writing, if you actually study writing for, for like, you know, in school, like, like Mike and I did, we went to graduate school for this shit. They, they beat you over the head without mercy with the show. Don't tell. If you can show something without telling it, show it and don't tell it. If you can use exposition by through context, like, you know, instead of saying, I got this scar when I was battling Chaka, 
on the streets of da 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 da, you switch it around and you say, "That's a nice scar on your arm. Would you like another one? You know that I gave you. Would you? Would you? Maybe I should complete my work and give you another one. You know what I mean? Like there's, yeah, from a comic book net standpoint, you, you can, yeah, you can, you can use context to get it out. And it's still, you know, it's still a little bit egregious, but it's, you, I mean, it's a comic. You, you give it, you give it a lot of latitude, but the, the constant physical narration of, of like, I always thought like in boxing matches, they always had that third commentator who's like, he just landed a jab and followed it up with a right hand. This isn't a radio. It's a television. <laughs> I have eyes. I saw he landed a jab. I don't need, you don't, you shouldn't have a job. <laughs> yeah. Especially in comic books. Like that's the whole point. Uh, the art shows it. You know, so you don't have to yeah. go over and tell what's happening. So, uh, and as, yeah, as a friend of mine said about uh, just closing remark here, a friend of mine said uh, about movies when I when I lived in L.A., he, he told me that a movie was really just it, it, it was a, I can't remember the exact phrase he used, but it was like there's a certain number of words on images. Movies are images. You have you have some dialogue and you have but m- movies are images. It's all visual. So you can keep everything else to a minimum if you do it right. And I feel like comic books are almost the same medium in a certain kind of way. Yeah, very much so, yeah. It's a visual medium, what I'm trying to say. So there it is, uh, Chris Mm -hmm. Claremont, uh, not his best. But I think John Byrne's work here is pretty solid. It's uh, Yeah, I enjoyed it. (laughs) Maybe not as fist. Maybe more for nostalgia (laughs) reasons, but... I liked some of his little touches. Like I liked the like that scene when he's lying on the platform and you see that girl, like you see her toes, you see that she's wearing like thick sandals and, and she's got like jeans with flames on the bottom and it's two tone <laughs> jeans, like dark denim, light denim. That's a nice touch. That was a nice little touch. I I really appreciate gestures like that. It shows an artist who's not, you know, who's not being lazy. Yeah, I think this is pretty solid burn though, Jank. Yeah. I mean, I know you didn't like his yeah. fist and that girl's leg was a little yeah. weird. I mean, not- yeah. It's not. I'm, I'm it's, not a. It's I'm, not Terry Austin sinking in, but uh, so it's not quite as good, I would say. But that's it's, fair. Not, it's not bad. You can definitely see the John Byrne influence in there. Yeah. I personally don't think this art is great by any means. I think it's okay, but uh-huh. I, I, I don't. Maybe it's nostalgia, but this, this art, and there is some good art in here for sure. But yeah, this, this art good. for me, especially like if you look at this last panel, is kind of indicative of it. I feel like these these monsters, these heroes, or the the bad guys look like shit. They're they're, they're terrible. <laughs> but the, the people yeah, at the desk, like that cool. that blonde guy with the glasses, like he's very well drawn. His hair, his face. You see his glasses, his tie, the way the way his suit is. He's twisting around. It's like extremely dynamic. The the body postures of people, like that blonde ponytail, and the girl is whipping from you know her off, off her shoulder, and that dude with the long side. Like I just really like, and the two tones, like the guy's got a green suit, green shirt, and they're two tones of green. Very, I I, I like the way that was done. I I'm, th- this artistic style is not my absolute favorite by any means, but I I feel like within the limits of the style, this was this was well done. With some blunders, like the fist looked bad, and and there's some things that just. I don't think we're well executed, but, and again, maybe it's nostalgia for, for what I consider to be one of the, the, the goldest eras of, of comics. Cause that's kind of what I grew up with is this particular style. Well, I, I would say about what, two years from now, Burns probably at his peak. Yeah. That sounds about right. Two years into his X-Men run. He's on the way up. He definitely so, did a good job of doing a self portrait. Cause I knew right away that that was John <laughs> Burns. <so. laughs> oh, that's good. All right. So Jank, what do you think? One out of 10 for Iron Fist issue eight. Uh, you know what? Uh, I'll, I'll go right down the middle and give it a five. Uh, it's not the worst thing I've ever read, but it's, it doesn't have a lot to really recommend it. All the Meacham stuff and kind of flashbacks, that all kind of reminded me of the TV show and made me think maybe the TV show didn't do such a bad job of interpreting this stuff. Maybe it just is boring <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> that's, so, to begin with. Well, that's, that's kind of my problem because I always think Iron Fist looks cool. I like, you know, punching things. And uh, so I'm like, this hero should be right up my alley. Why don't I like him? And I think the problem is I don't like Danny Rand, you know? Like, yeah. uh, to, mm-hmm. I love Spider Man because I love Peter Parker, you know? I like Captain America. Yeah, I love yeah. Steve Rogers. Um, I, love I the just, thing. <laughs> I don't like Danny Rand. He's not interesting. He's not funny. He's not, uh, he's bland. I don't know. He never appeals to me. So. Yeah, he needs a better alter ego. <laughs> and I, anyway. I mean, I'm sure there are ways you can make him interesting. They just had not figured those out yet. <laughs> I don't know that they have yet either, but I'm sure somebody could do it. 
Yeah, because, man, he is cool, man. The glowing fist, punching things, it's pretty awesome. I'll give it a six. Uh, sure he has an iron fist as well. Like, he looks good. All the iron fist shots look good in here. So Yeah, the story's not the best. Uh, the writing's pretty awful. Uh, but the cover's great, and I like the art. <laughs> yeah, so it should be like a five, or, but I'll go a six just because I, I like the cover and uh, John Burns art here. Uh, Miles, what do you think? I'm going to surprise you guys. My initial reading of this, I, I read it. And I was like, this is like an eight and a half. Oh, wow. And yeah, <laughs> initially, that was my initial. And then I started to realize, like, because I was laughing at how bad some of it was, I was yeah. entertained to the end. And like, we have read comics that were much better than this that I that I didn't enjoy. They were mm. just not, there was something missing. There was no joy in it. There was no, like, fun in it. And I read this in like five minutes. Because I kind of enjoyed what was happening. Like, I, I can't really explain it exactly. If you ever watch a bad movie that really holds your interest, oh, I'll yeah. howl into your sisters a yeah, all ever. the time. <laughs> you know, this, yeah, exactly. Well, it's they don't all hold our interest. Jokes sometimes. Sucks. You know, because like some of the movies when we on LCS, when we watch a bad movie, sometimes it's a fun bad movie. And sometimes it's like going to the dentist bad movie. It's It's just fucking horrific. This was bad, but I enjoyed it, and I turned pages right to the end. It never really lost me. As a, it, The exposition is awful. A lot of the dialogue is fucking horrific. The narration while they're fighting is dumb. And, like, Chaka, crime lord of blah, blah. I mean, that's laugh out loud bad. Plus the, the fact they're like, let's change into our costumes as we're running up 80 flights of stairs to, to storm this boardroom, they change from their gangster costumes into these ridiculous masks out of Halloween three. Um, <laughs> it, it, that's just dumb. But for some reason I was carried away by the aggressive energy and overflowing stupidity of this. And so I'm going to give it a seven. <laughs> wow. Look at that. A seven. I think uh, Iron Fist definitely needs his own Mr. Fish or something like that to make it better. <laughs> I like the beginning of the story, the you know the mugging yeah. and whatnot. In the end, it was exciting there. That last panel, like, oh my god, the bad guys are here. But there's a lot of dull stuff there in the in between. It's just a lot of dollsville that you got to get through. But uh, they you know. tried too hard in this issue to tell too much story, and we've had that issue before with other comics that I've been on here to review. Um, uh, storytellers who were like. I've got three comics worth of story and I'm going to cram it into this and give backstory and give character motivation to like, cause you've got that girl who's, you know, meet you. You've got the blonde, you've got the, the, the white dude in the bad costume. Who's ugly. We got Bill uh, Howe. Hinting... What happened to Bill Howe? I wanna... Exactly. You've got <laughs> Bill Howe. You've got, and then you have the internal struggle yeah, of Iron like Fist that. himself, right? He's, he's brooding about his childhood and like, there, there's a lot of – and then you have the gangsters and their own drama, the the woman, the personal drama with the woman and the, the head gang. It's like there's a little too much going on here by about 20 percent, and I feel like if you'd hide mm -hmm. some of that off, it would, have, it would have made more sense and flowed smoother. Not that I had trouble reading it, but I've never understood why some comics feel like they have to – it's like a bathtub, and they, they just keep pouring water into it after it's overflowing. It's like you're not getting more for your money by doing that. In my opinion, there's a certain yeah. point at which you overload a structure till it starts to collapse. And this is not quite there, but it's definitely overcrowded. They're, they're trying to do too much in, in 19 pages. Well, what do you think happened to Bill Howe? All right, so there it is, Iron <laughs> Fist issue 8, 1976. Uh, Jack, what do you got for us next week? All right, so I figured I would kind of do uh, a little takeoff on what you're doing this week where uh, – We'd already done you or you and Mike L had already done like Power Man and Iron Fist, and uh, we did Power Man uh, a little yep. bit ago. So then we did Iron Fist now to kind of close out that trilogy. So <laughs> similar to that, uh, there was a DC book that oh, was also man. a team up that we. Uh, <laughs> you and Mike L did the first one, Green Arrow, Green Lantern. Oh, um, oh then we covered okay. Green Lantern, Longbow Hunters not yep. too long ago. So I figured it was about time we do a Green Lantern issue. All right. Um, and doing? to do that, I I called in. Uh, oh no! A first timer for this show. Oh, okay. first timer. <laughs> My cousin Pete. Pete, biggest Green Lantern fan I know. Oh, gonna be joining I... us next week. Oh, this will be great. <laughs> yeah, Jenks' cousin Pete. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna be doing Green Lantern number two fifteen from nineteen eighty seven. So Green Lantern issue two fifteen. 
I got to be honest, Jank. I actually considered picking a Green Lantern just for that exact reason because we had done <laughs> Green Arrow and we hadn't done a. We did a Secret Origins issue with Green Lantern. Remember where he oh, calls oh, yeah. the guy Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> racist. Uh, and we did the like you mentioned, we did the Green Arrow, Green Lantern, where uh, Speedy was on heroin. He's on the smack. Yeah, last <laughs> film. But uh, so this will be Pretty Green sweet. Lantern next week. All right, well, yeah. Miles Watson got Thank a good you. cover with uh, an alien making out with a lady. So <laughs> get ready for that. Can't beat that. Wait, an alien was it? Was it Alf? <laughs> I hope. It looks like God's <laughs> ears. Oh. Was it Alf making out with a chimp? Well, now you're just making <laughs> now you're just now, I'm just now I'm just trying to turn <laughs> that would you be on. a shoo-in for all the fleas. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miles Watson, thank you so much for joining us. Remind everybody, one uh, nine books dot com or go to Amazon dot com. Just search for Miles Watson. He's got uh, Cage Life, Knuckle Down, the uh, Sinners Cross, the Very Dead of Winter, the Devils You Know, and a bunch of other little uh, novellas and stuff you can read. He's quite the writer, this Miles Watson. You know, go buy some books. Yeah, buy buy my shit so that I can uh, buy more copies of Iron Fist. Fist, Fist, Fist. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we can find out what happened to that dude, Chow, whatever his name is. Bill Howe. Yeah, Bill. Uh, Bill Howe. Sorry, uh, Bill Howe. We we need to know. Howe. Inquiring hey, minds want to know. Maybe in the comments section on the YouTube, you can, uh, you listeners out there, what do you think happened to Bill Howe? <laughs> Let us know. What you yeah, think. No cheating. <laughs> just, just give us your ideas. Don't cheat and look. We'll figure it out. I think he lived a long, successful life. <laughs> All right, so until, until next week, don't get any drink on you. <laughs>